I just wanted to uh, spend a minute talking about the center um, that, uh, that I direct and um, acknowledge um, Carrie Rice, who's the coordinator for the Center for Service Learning and Civic Engagement and who um, played a, a role in organizing today's events. Um, the center has been around only for two years, but in the two years we've been around, I think we've, we've succeeded quite a bit. Most of our role is to build the capacity of faculty and students on campus to do service learning in the community, as well as develop community partnerships um, uh, for, for those endeavors. Um, we've succeeded in developing workshops, uh, grants, faculty, and, uh, faculty grants, uh, student grants, and, uh, and uh, faculty in residence program, which allows once one faculty each semester to get a course release to work with the center and to develop their own service learning course. Um, this year, we've also been successful in, in at least beginning a process where we've been taking some of the programs we've already done on campus and developing the service learning component. Uh, I know Tim Hagopian will be here later to talk about the, um, uh, he's here now, he's just hiding behind the camera. Um, usually he's hiding in front of the camera, so that's a different <laughs> spot for Tim. Um, but uh, the uh, Earned Income Tax Credit Tax Assistance Program, um, we're developing a curriculum for that. And this year we've had a couple of lectures along with the folks who've learned to do taxes and to help people with them. Um, we've also added a course component to the Alternative Spring Break, um, which I think Carrie or some of the students who went will be talking about a little later. Um, uh, as well as a variety of internships, including uh, an internship uh, a student is doing now, helping Friendly House with their self-assessment survey. Um, and we continue to, to sponsor community research uh, programs. Dave McMahon is here. Our first report was the Mending Fences Report, which was a neighborhood impact study um, on uh, transitional housing programs in the community. And, and that's a report that I think is, has uh, made a difference here in, in the community for a couple of years now. Um, and the most exciting thing that I wanted to mention for, from the center uh, before I introduce Maureen, although Maureen's a very exciting thing too, um, is uh, <laughs> we're, we're all males, um, is, uh, is that we've, um, we, we just received a, a letter this week that um, we've now established a, a Robert F. Kennedy um, uh, Fellows Program. Uh, a lot in partnership with the RFK Children Action Corps, um, in which uh, students who three students who have completed their junior year uh, can apply for this fellows program, in which they'll receive summer jobs during the uh, preceding their senior year. They'll receive a full scholarship, tuition and fees for their senior year. Um, they'll do paid internships during their senior year at RFK. Uh, and then the, uh, the quid pro quo is that they commit to, do, to working for RFK for one year after graduation. Um, but we feel that not only will this help RFK in their leadership training um, for the future um, and, 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 uh, and, and the real crisis that's coming for human service uh, employment, but also um, we really feel that this, uh, that this bolsters the center's work and we'll be working to develop a whole curriculum around that scholars program. So we're very excited about that. Um, so now I'd like to introduce uh, the, you're not the director, are you? You have a different title. You're executive, executive director. Just Maureen Powell. Okay, just Maureen Powell. Just Maureen Powell. <laughs> Thank you. The Intergenerational Urban Institute is really delighted to be able to join forces with the Center for Civic Engagement on campus and to celebrate across ages the great things that are happening, the wonderful things that you all are doing. And I think it is so important to really, truly celebrate it with all kinds of hoopla because you know what? This world is having a tough time. And it needs every single one of us to do whatever we can do. And as it turns out, when we do it together, we have this collective impact, and that's very important. The Intergenerational Urban Institute has been around since 2003, but even more exciting than that, having elders on campus, this fall we will celebrate our 25th anniversary of being an intergenerational campus. And that in and of itself is exciting. But we didn't stop there. We decided we needed to reach out to the high school students uh, around the greater Worcester area. And we've landed um, ourselves in, at our first pull with the um, South High, 
the, now I always say it, the Academy of Education, Government, and Service. Did I get it right? Service and government. Service and government. Well, what can I tell you? Service before government. Uh, with um, the Youth Policy Council. So we feel that we've spread our wings, and Ruby and some of the other students here, and I and Maureen Benenda were able to uh, go to Minnesota this uh, last week, and the National Council on Youth Involvement, and the title of the conference was Youth for a Change. And I think what we're trying to embody here is that all of us are for a change. And I will just add that the greatest part of the whole conference was that we got back because just above where we were in Minneapolis, there were two feet of snow. So <laughs> I never was so glad to come back to New England. Well, we have a full afternoon here, and I want to um, turn this over to Vice President Julie Woolman, who is the academic vice president for the campus. And just to tell you that you see the helium in the you see how the helium keeps the balloons up? Well, somebody with that kind of energy and support in the vice president's office makes it possible for service to happen on this campus. So we welcome you, Julie. Thank you. Great. The room is full for this celebration, and we have a beautiful day to welcome you to our campus. Thank you all for being here. Um, it's important to us that you're all with us today to celebrate service learning and ser service in general. We realize how important service learning is to our students' intellectual and civic development and growth. And we realize that our service learning experiences that we're able to give our students um, and all of our, our um, participants across the generations are some of the most salient learning experiences that they will ever have in their lives. We also realize how important service learning is to our community, to the, to the city of Worcester and to the surrounding community. As a public institution, it's part of our promise and our commitment to our community to collaborate with our community partners and to provide service and to improve the community. So we're happy to be here to celebrate that commitment. Something very exciting happened to the college recently. We were named to the President's Community Service Honor Roll. That is the President of the United States. Um, the President's Community Service Honor Roll, the Corporation for National and Community Service, named Worcester State College to the President's Higher Education Community Service Honor Roll for exemplary service efforts and service to disadvantaged youth. This is a, a, rec a recognition that was launched in 2006. The Community Service Honor Roll is the highest federal recognition a school can achieve for its commitment to service learning and civic engagement. And we've been recognized that way. And that is thanks to the work of Corey Dolgan, the director of our Center for Service Learning and Civic Engagement, Carrie Rice, the VISTA volunteer who works with Corey, and Maureen Power with the Intergenerational Organization. So, we didn't just get that honor because we're great. We got it because these people are working really hard to make these things happen on our campus and to help our students go out into the community and, and be involved. So I'm delighted to be here and to have these energetic and devoted faculty members carrying out our commitment to service. Now I get to introduce our speaker, which is a special honor. Senator Ed Augustus is a Democrat from Worcester, serving his second term in the Massachusetts Senate, representing many of the areas in Worcester and the surrounding towns. Augustus serves as Senate Chair of the Joint Committee on Election Laws and Chair of the Senate Committee on Bills in the Third Reading. He can explain what that means to all of us. <laughs> he also served as Senate Vice Chair of the Joint Education Committee, very important to us, of course, Senate Vice Chair of the Joint Committee on Veterans and Federal Affairs, and Senate Chair of the Joint Committee on Public Service. He is a very busy man. 
In addition, he serves as a member of the Senate Ways and Means Committee and the Joint Committee on Labor and Workforce Development. And with all of that going on, I think we're really lucky to have him here today. Um, Ed Augustus is the first in his family to graduate from college. And that makes him a person who's very special to us at Worcester State because so many of our students are the first in their families to attend college and to graduate from college. He worked his way through Suffolk University in Boston to earn a bachelor's degree in government and history, and in 1999 received a master's degree in government from the Johns Hopkins University in Washington, D.C. So he's an inspiration for our students and for us. He's a strong supporter of community service, service learning, and our hunger initiatives, and I'm delighted to welcome him to Worcester State today. Thank you. Let me, uh, let me first just uh, congratulate the folks who are on the uh, program today to receive uh, well-deserved recognition and awards. Um, certainly, uh, Anne uh, I'm somebody, is somebody I'm very familiar with her work and, and know the difference that she's made in this community, especially on issues around housing and homelessness. And uh, we're all inspired by your work and congratulate you on the award. Uh, but all the recipients really uh, deserve uh, a great uh, thank you from a, a community that really needs people to care. You know, I, I was sitting here kind of thinking about, you know, what do you say to encourage people uh, to make service part of their life? Not only if they're in a program uh, in college or they're in a program in their church, but just having it be part of what people think of as a well-rounded life, a well-lived life. Uh, the idea that part of that life would encompass serving a community or giving back to other people. I, and I think Worcester State College does a great job of trying to instill in its students, whether they be students who are 18 years old coming out of high school or they are students who are later in life coming back to take course, courses or, or work on a degree, understanding that uh, being a citizen in a democracy really counts on people caring about their community and being vested in that community and understanding the needs of that community. So in so many ways, we're not just training people to be artists or engineers or doctors or uh, urban planners. We're training people to be <coughs> citizens. Uh, that's really what anybody who's been watching the, the John Adams uh, series on HBO um, the Founding Fathers had this really kind of profound idea that this whole experiment of democracy, uh, and we did it before any other place in the world did it. We did it when there was a, a king in England and a king in France and a czar in Russia, and uh, Italy wasn't even a country. Uh, we had a democracy, and we were doing an experiment. And the experiment was completely dependent on the idea that citizens would care, would be educated, uh, would pay attention, and would be involved. And a number of years later, when uh, Tocqueville came to this country and tried to figure out what makes this country tick, that's what he came back and, and concluded, is the idea that citizens felt empowered to solve problems for themselves. Their first instinct wasn't always to ask the government to do it, but it was how they would come together as a community, whether it be neighbors or fellow farmers, and erect a barn, or put a dam uh, in a river, or solve their problems collectively and relying on each other. Uh, and that really is what has made the United States the great country uh, that we are. This idea that we all have a responsibility uh, for making this country what, he, what we want it to be. So I guess the, the challenge is, how many people have ever driven down the street and seen a homeless person with a sign uh, on an intersection, or seen some kind of a problem and said, you know, somebody ought to do something about that? Well, we're the somebody. We're the somebody who's supposed to do something about that. Uh, we have lots of people who are able to identify the problems, but not a lot of people who are willing to roll up their sleeves and do something about it. So I just want to touch for a minute about the issue of homelessness, because I know it's something that a lot of students have been working on, and one of the groups that are going to be recognized today. I had the opportunity to serve last year on both the, the homeless commission here in the city of Worcester that the city manager had appointed, uh, and a statewide homeless commission that was 
mandated by legislation. I was appointed by the Senate President to serve on that. So amongst my other committee assignments, uh, we add that one to it. But it was a great opportunity for me to really educate myself about the issue of homelessness uh, and about what our responsibilities are as a community, as a society, um, as an advanced democracy, uh, as the wealthiest country on the face of the earth. What are our responsibilities uh, to our fellow citizens who find themselves uh, in a circumstance where they have nowhere to live? Now, some of those people are families uh, who are fleeing domestic violence. Uh, increasingly, they're families who have been, had their homes foreclosed upon, maybe victims of predatory lending practices that are now coming home. Uh, to roost and really causing havoc in many of our communities across the country. Uh, and some people are people who have dealt with their entire lives, mental illness, substance abuse, or other issues, uh, and they're what we sometimes call the chronically homeless, people who have literally lived uh, huge chunks of their lives on our streets, under our bridges, really in front of our very noses. And we drive by each and every day saying, somebody should do something about that. So we came together as those two commissions and tried to make some recommendations on what we, collectively, and again, that's really what government is supposed to be. It's supposed to be all of us doing things together that we can't necessarily do on our own, and saying that that's a priority for us, that we don't want to live in a country where we allow or we accept uh, as just part of the way it is that our fellow citizens, huge numbers, thousands of our fellow citizens can be homeless. Uh, and live uh, in the kind of conditions that some of them have to live in. So the governor put in $10 million in his budget to combat uh, homelessness. And I'm happy to say that the House budget that came out today uh, also uh, matched that $10 million and said, yeah, uh, the governor was right in making that a priority. I am hopeful uh, that when the Senate budget comes out in a few weeks, we will do likewise. And that will be one area of agreement that this is an issue that we can solve, that if we make it a priority and find the political will, this is an issue that we can solve, uh, that we can raise our kind of collective voices and say, this is something that is unacceptable in a country like ours. And it's complicated. Now, I don't want to pretend or suggest that it's not a complicated issue. There are a lot of different factors that go into trying to end homelessness. And we've come up with some recommendations locally about trying to create uh, a center, a referral center, that some of the feeder systems to a homelessness, whether it be people who are being released from prison, or it be people who are being released from hospitals or other institutions who don't have a place to live, uh, they can be identified before they leave those institutions, and we can try to find them what we call housing first. Instead of saying to them, go through the shelter door and stay there for some period of time and then maybe we'll find you a place to live or maybe that's the way you're going to be for years, that we're going to try to find an appropriate place for you to live first and do whatever the appropriate wraparound services are, if it's substance <coughs> abuse or mental health uh, counseling or job training, whatever it may be, we're going to try to put you in a, in a stable, respectable place to live wrap around those services. And you know what? In most cases, it means it's a very cost-effective way of doing things. Not only is it a more humane way of doing things, but it's a much more cost-effective way of doing things. We have some folks who've had 100 or more emergency room admissions in one year. People who are chronically homeless. That's a very expensive way to deliver health care. Uh, that's a very expensive uh, symptom of the problem of homelessness. And so the idea is, can we look at this totally differently and not make housing a reward at the end of a shelter system, but do it up front with the appropriate services? Uh, and it's a really kind of radical notion, but I think it's one uh, that is going to pay great dividends. Uh, and I think it is, in my mind, one of the, the brightest prospects of us actually uh, ending homelessness here in our city and in our state. And I think there is finally the political will uh, to do that. Now, that all sounds great. You say, all right, let's do it. Ten million dollars, let's do it. A lot of the challenge comes when you try to identify the locations 
And we're, if you're reading the newspaper, you're, you're reading about some of the controversy that's going on in one particular neighborhood in the city as they try to put some of these housing first sites online. So people who theoretically say, yeah, I want to end homelessness, and I don't want a big PIP shelter in downtown Worcester and all of the, the issues that that brings to a neighborhood, at the same time can't say that, geez, I don't want any places for these people to live. And that's what we're trying to do with the housing first model. We're trying to put those places online so that we don't have to have the big shelters like the PIP shelter. But you, it doesn't seem to me to be intellectually consistent to say I'm against both of them. You can't be for ending homelessness and getting rid of big shelters that have a negative impact on a neighborhood and then be against the idea of creating housing opportunities so people don't have to live on the street or live in shelters, too. Now, that is not to say that there aren't legitimate concerns that every neighborhood has when an institution might come to that neighborhood. But I think that one of the things we need to do as a city, and I think this is particularly the case in Worcester, but Framingham and other places have had a real challenge with this, we need to lower the rhetoric. We need to lower the rhetoric uh, as we discuss citing some of these locations in the city. Uh, and we need those of us who are in political office, as tempting as it might be, uh, to bang on the table and to thrust our fist in the air and tell the crowd what they want to hear. I think it's our obligation as elected officials and as leaders in the community to, to act as a, as a broker between the two sides and try to help each other see the other side's point of view and find common ground. Uh, too often, uh, all the incentives have been toward being a demagogue on the issue, and the political rewards too often have been on that side. And that's where you all come in. That's where the democracy part of this comes in. Uh, because if you care about ending homelessness, and you buy into the notion there's a better way to do it than what we've been trying for the last 20 or 30 or 40 years, and this housing first model might be one strategy to do it, it's important for you to weigh in on these different siting issues when we try to put these locations online. And it's also important that you uh, reward the political leaders and the community leaders who stand up for that uh, and not reward the political leaders and the community leaders who demagogue that. Because if you keep rewarding people for being a demagogue and playing to the crowd, then you're going to get a lot more of that. That's just the way it works. Um, and so this is not a passive spectator sport, uh, politics and solving the issue of homelessness. This is something that requires all of you to be involved. And doing things like the Walk for Homeless to End Homelessness and all of the other programs, those are important parts. But I think also being politically involved and active and paying attention and adding your voice to the debate uh, and making sure your point of view and your priorities are, are heard uh, is so, so important. Because the loud voices and the um, demagogic voices are always going to be there. You have to decide whether you want them to have the stage to themselves or whether you want to weigh in and counter that. So I guess that's my challenge to you. Uh, all of your, your commitment and your service, it also has to, I think, have a component to it uh, about government and about being involved politically. Uh, because you're going to see firsthand what those needs are. You have an important perspective as you're involved in your community working on these issues. Don't let it just be that. Take what you've learned, take the lessons and the perspectives that you've seen and translate it into trying to have bigger and broader impact by being engaged in the political process. Whether it be simply showing up at candidates' forums and saying to candidates, hey, where do you stand on this issue? Asking those tough questions. I mean, I've run for, for elective office long enough to know that when I go to candidate forums, sometimes it's me and my opponents and our supporters but a handful of citizens who are actually out there. So we're talking to each other so often. Uh, that is what is expected of the citizens that we are trying to create. 
uh, through our educational systems and what our democracy kind of relies on, is the idea of citizens who are knowledgeable and engaged. Um, certainly by being here and your involvement, you show uh, that you, you care about those things and you bring that to the table. So I just urge you to continue. And, and this issue of homelessness and ending homelessness, it is going to require your active engagement. I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. And I'm going to draw on your help in, in making the award in just a minute. The first award to be given this afternoon is the Degnan Award for Intergenerational Service. And this award is in memory of a woman named Evelyn Degnan who came back to school uh, after she had retired and soon after her husband had died. And Evelyn had lived a life of volunteerism. She had done a lot of work um, with young children. When she came to Worcester State, she got involved in urban studies. And she was one of the people who helped to develop the whole Intergenerational Urban Institute. And at that time, we had a certificate in gerontology. And when we went to this intergenerational, ever after, she would always stop me and say, Maureen, you're talking too much about older people. We've got to involve the kids. It's all about younger and older people together. Well, Evelyn, while she was here at school, and she did graduate with her degree in urban studies, a number of things happened to her. Her son died of a brain tumor. Um, she herself got cancer three different times. And each time after treatment, she came back to campus. She came back, she graduated, and then she continued to be a part of our intergenerational framework. She helped us start our first program, was working with teen moms. And that spirit of courage and tenacity and also good humor is one that people across ages need. And when we looked this year and we thought about whom should we award this to, immediately came to mind Ann Gibbon Smith and the work that she has done uh, across ages in helping to uh, ferment and form and support ya. Yeah. What's ya? Yeah? How many times do you say ya? Yeah? Ya yeah is youth against homelessness. Yeah, yeah that's right. You got it. <laughs> so Central Mass Housing Alliance had helped, has helped to start this group. <laughs> And what they're all about is they envision a Worcester where homelessness is no longer an issue. When their services will no longer be needed. But till then, they are working very, very hard to end homelessness. And we want to celebrate you, Anne. We want to celebrate the way in which you work with young people and people of all ages, the way in which you inspire all of us. And we'd like to ask you to come forward, please. And <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, he says the Degnan Intergenerational Service Award presented to Ann Gibbon Smith, Central Mass Housing Alliance, in recognition of outstanding community service in establishing YA. take right over. Um, on behalf of YA and Central Mass Housing Alliance, it's truly, YA. <laughs> it's truly an honor and I am so humbled uh, to receive this award in uh, memory of Evelyn Degnan, who was, I think, a real leader and an inspiration to the Urban Studies Department here. Um, and she sounds like she was truly an incredible, incredible person. And I think like uh, the Senator said and the other speakers have, uh, ahead of me have said, um, service learning is just so important. And the work that CMHA has been able to do with Youth Against Homelessness and all other volunteers and service providers throughout the community, uh, this is truly what's going to make a difference. People giving their time and investing their time and their energy uh, into causes that they're really interested in and, and changing and changing this community for the better. So it doesn't all end here. Today is a wonderful celebration of service learning uh, from everybody that is involved. Um, 
and let's just keep going and let's keep YA yeah going. It's an incredible group of kids from high schools all across the city who are educating themselves, trying to make this community a better place for families and individuals who are experiencing the struggles of homelessness and they are taking steps, 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 steps to really put an end to it. And with everybody's efforts, someday it's going to happen. So thank you. And Kate Kerr, would you come forward, please? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Oh my God, I'm so excited. And just have to tell you that, y'all, we love y'all and we love what we do. So we're going to keep on doing it and um, just wait to see what you come up with next. Thank you. <laughs> Central Mass Housing Alliance um, has been a really wonderful sponsor for our um, intern, Kate Kerr, and this is an example of how mutually beneficial something can be because um, uh, they really needed someone of Kate's uh, capacity, and Kate wanted to do something really special. So, Kate, you've done a wonderful job with Yah, and we also want to give you one of Frankie Morland's. <laughs> through this service learning aspect of Dr. Maureen Powers' human needs class. I don't know if anybody in here is taking it, but the community service part could seem a little daunting at first, but I'm so glad I did it because I got to meet these kids, and they have great initiatives going right now. One of them is the cookies that are for sale over there on the table. <laughs> they sell those cookies I, for a dollar a piece, and if you're you know, wanting to do community service, every dollar that we sell goes right to homeless initiatives here in Worcester. We plan on selling a 1,000 cookies, so that's a $1,000. So thank you. <laughs> It's really a pleasure for me to be part of the celebration uh, of service across the ages. I've been involved with Maureen for a little while, and uh, it's nice to be here to celebrate the work of this very unselfish, dedicated woman. And you are quite a beautiful role model. It's a pleasure to have you here. It's a pleasure to recognize you. You remind me very much of the volunteers of the Institute and your unselfishness, and the award that you have received certainly is well-deserved. But also, we want to think of our young people, as Martin has said, because <clears throat> they're our future, they're our tomorrow. We pass the flame of hope to them, and they carry it like the Olympic torch. And we know that they will carry it well, and through their work, make this world a better place for all of us. So, these two young ladies. She disappeared on me. <laughs> well, we're going to read it. Yeah. Not sure anyway. <laughs> Ruby and Kate, and the Institute, as well as the Center for Service Learning is very proud to honor you for your work with youth oh, against you. homelessness. Thank you very much. And now are we gonna have the rest of the students? Well, um, well actually we're gonna just we're, have you just, we're gonna you know we gave them special bags and goodies from Worcester State College yeah. and this is for all the participants. Oh, okay. And thank we'll be as the president. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but uh, this is the second year that the Center for Service Learning and Civic Engagement has given out a student award for civic engagement. And uh, this year, I would like to introduce the Director of Multicultural Affairs, Marcella Uribe Jennings, to uh, give out that award. Thank you, Corey and Carrie, for allowing me, uh, Maureen, for allowing me the opportunity to celebrate the accomplishment of those who I deem to be at the heart of what we do at this institution, and I'm sure at the high schools and every other institution, and that is to celebrate the accomplishment of our students. Um, I think that given the current challenges our society faces, it's more than refreshing to know that our students and leaders um, who are, high, are continuing to be highly engaged in the community. Civic engagement, the ability to identify, assess, and impact issues of public concern, to organize around particular um, issues that affect their community. This particular student who is currently a junior with a major in history has demonstrated through her actions, her enjoyment and concerns with the issues that face this community, particularly Worcester State and outside of Worcester. She was one of the key members on behalf of her student organization, TWA, to work tireless, tirelessly to promote a courageous conversation with Dr. Connell West here on campus, 
But while working with her, it was not enough to just bring a speaker to Worcester State like we would do normally, but it was very important for her to make sure that she had support across campus, the high school students would be involved, that it would be open to the community because he was someone that would have a lot to say about courageous conversations of topics that affect all of us. Um, she's truly a leader. Um, I think she is successful at everything that she does. Not only was she able to coordinate, implement this event here at Worcester State, she was able to connect to some of the same issues that our community was dealing with. She works tirelessly with other civic engagement here at, um, in the Worcester community. She's involved with her church. She works for cancer. She will be a chairperson for the Multicultural Student Organization next year. And also very important is the fact that she will be joining the State House this summer to work um, in her internship with the governor and, her staff, and their staff. It gives me great joy to announce this year's recipient of the Civic Engagement Award, Nana Ajima. Well, um, when I first started um, this event, I actually didn't realize how big it was going to be. Uh, we, it was very hard at first, but um, with the direction of certain people like Marcella and Domingo, I was able to direct to with people among um, the people on campus as well as off campus. Um, it's been such, I, the expectance of um, that event was so grand. I didn't even expect that at all. Um, I can't believe we got that many, we were able to get that many people to come to that event. And I'm actually very proud and very happy from all the, I'm very happy that all the, um, I'm sorry, I'm just a little <laughs> nervous. Um, a lot of organizations on campus were able to jump on board and help out, and they were so willing to help out. It, it kind of made me more optimistic and made me want this event to go on because I felt as if people on campus were more, they, were, they really wanted this to happen. And so it kind of brought us on the same level and we were able to make it happen. And I hope next year we have great events like that too. Um, we're well connected with everybody on campus as well as off campus, basically making it consortium wise. So this is a great honor, and I thank you so much for this award. Congratulations. There are so many different kinds of service to celebrate on this campus, and it's impossible to do it all in this short period of time. But we wanted to give you a few highlights. So I'm going to ask these two characters to come forward. Hi, I'm Joan and I'm in Maureen's class. And the service we want to highlight is Donations Clearinghouse, which um, they collect high, uh, household items that people donate and they have them in a warehouse and people that are just getting out of shelters who basically have nothing can come and get some of the things that they need. So I'm sure a lot of you have things in your attic or basement that is just sitting there that you know someday you might use. So tomorrow the truck will be here on campus in the morning. So that'd be a good day to bring those items in and give them to people who can use them now. Hi, I'm Danielle, and I just wanted to talk about some of the items that we're collecting. Um, we're looking for anything that people need to make a home. Things like end tables, kitchen tables, dining room tables, chairs. Sitting chairs, lamps, mirrors, small appliances, dish sets, silverware sets, um, drinking glasses, coffee mugs, uh, pots and pans, dressers. Um, they're not really looking for large items tomorrow, but if you do have large items like sofas or mattresses, which are really, they need mattresses, um, you can call for a pickup and there should be little flyers on all of your tables with it. Just to note too, they're not looking for um, bed and bath linens, uh, curtains, things like that because it is a warehouse and they could get musty. Or wine glasses, no toys, no books, um, or really big items obviously, no knickknacks, but just things that can make their new apartments homes. So just, it's 12, 12, 12, 9 to 12, so. Thank you. Last year was the first time we did this at Worcester State, working with Ann and, and the Donations Clearinghouse. And at first I was so upset because the truck looked so empty. 
but by 12 noon it was filled to the brim. So I know we can do it again. Please be sure to bring your stuff. Um, Tim Hagopian is going to come up and just tell us a few words. Uh, you know what today's date is, right? The 16th. You know what yesterday was? <laughs> tax day. Well, this is a fellow who knows a lot about tax day. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, this was uh, a banner year for us with the economic stimulus payment. I don't know how to feel about it, but uh, <laughs> it was different and, and all sorts of issues this year. But we did very well. We started off in 2004 tax season, did over 100 people, federal and state taxes, e-filed, 2005, just over 200, 2006, just over 300. Without planning for it, for some reason it grows by 100. People tell just enough other people we do a good enough job and they come. Sure enough, just over 400, we did it, 420 actually this year, and uh, probably serve 500, we don't e-file everybody, but the actual e-files are 420, uh, federal and state, so that's 840 forms sent through. It's a lot of uh, work, and I'd like to thank uh, Holy Cross uh, students uh, sitting down over here, um, Aaron and Meg and uh, Julianne who uh, for the first year Holy Cross coordinated with Worcester State, so they're getting some credit the, through the consortium. And what a great project. They got a great thing for their resume, certificate from the IRS, and great experience dealing with people, all sorts of kinds of people, you wouldn't believe. Uh, but Worcester State gets a lot of exposure. These folks are coming up uh, from the city and seeing our campus. No one got ticketed. It was great. I guess I'm sorry. <laughs> I planned it. I start at 3.30. I think the guys go home at 3.30. So it all worked out, and we had a whole other group, of course, of Worcester State students, um, and two volunteers from all Com Bank. So it was a different year. We had a combination. So really great thing. So spread the word. Next year, I assume the program will be on again. We, we will e-file uh, for free for you and uh, get you some, some money. We specialize in earned income tax credit, which is how Maureen's uh, Power started the whole program. Uh, to make sure people who are eligible for that, for that earned income tax credit, that they file for it. It's easily forgotten about, including the IRS. They'll accidentally forget to file that form if they feel maybe you don't deserve it, but in fact you do by law. And it brings money into the local community, and that's what we're all about. Since I've got the, uh, the podium, I'll ask the senator. <laughs> to simplify the state taxes. <laughs> it's very difficult. Yes, yes. Yeah. Massachusetts taxes are more difficult than the federal tax. But anyway, uh, that's what we're doing, and we'll do it again next year. Earn income tax credit is what we're about, and helping the public, and we, we save them probably $40,000 collectively with, uh, with that much uh, service. So, thank you, everybody. If you add how much money that then pours into the Worcester economy, you get an idea of what kind of an impact it can make. Well, speaking of in impacts, we want to talk uh, a little bit. Alicia, are you here? Oh, she had to leave? Well, we have an immigrant tutoring program, and you can see the um, billboard for that over there. We tutor immigrants on this campus every Tuesday afternoon. And we also tutor immigrants at 425 Pleasant Street, Worcester Housing Authority. And we tutor uh, immigrants over at Bet Shalom. So um, this is one of those good deals. It's a one credit practicum. And if you need one credit and you like to be with people, just come see us. Because you don't have to have any experience in English as a, as a second language. All you have to do is speak the English. And then what happens is we help with conversation. And we've had several of the immigrants who've worked with us also get their citizenship, so we're happy to, um, to be a part of that as well. Oh, is anybody here from the Alternative Spring Break? Carrie, do you want to speak about that? Sure. See, I knew I knew you from somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, so this year uh, was our second year doing an Alternative Spring Break to the Center for Service Learning. Um, unfortunately, most of the students that went this year are in class right now, so they weren't able to make it. Um, but if they were here, I would thank them profusely for all the hard work that they do. Uh, we go to Nicaragua, and we do a lot of cultural activities. Um, we are involved in classes down there, but then we do a lot of hands-on hands work, um, trying to better the community that we work with down there. So it's it's pretty incredible to see what these students do in just um, a short time. So I'm going to pretend they're here and thank them for their hard work. Um, 
and I hope to do it again next year. Thank you. And I will add that none of that would happen without Carrie, who's a wonderful team leader and uh, a great ambassador for us as well. Uh, finally, some of you may have read the newspaper article just yesterday about the soaring cost of food. And if you haven't read it, you know about it when you go to buy a gallon of milk or a loaf of bread. Uh, we've got a serious problem on our hands, and we also have a way that's already uh, on the books. Uh, we have a public policy that can help people get food the way everybody else does in the supermarket. It's called food stamps. And we've been working with that program for a while. And Gladys, do you want to? Are you here still? You didn't run away. Okay, no. come on. Can you speak just a little bit? Sorry. Um, I'm a student here at Worcester State College and enrolled in the um, Consortium Gerontology Certificate Program. And about four years ago, I took a course with Dr. Power, and uh, I had to do a service. Um, I had a service requirement for the course, and I chose to work with the food stamp program. Well, that was four years ago, and I'm still working with the food stamp program. She did it by choice. Yes, it did. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I have been helping people apply for food stamps uh, at many different locations, including uh, St. Paul's Food Pantry, the Worcester Community Action Council. I went to a Worcester church through the South High Group. Um, and several senior centers in the area. And I've spoken with these uh, South High students as well as um, Worcester State students and worked with them um, doing food stamp applications. So I've met and interacted with so many dedicated people who are instrumental in fighting the hunger problem and making the food stamp program more accessible and more easy to navigate here in, Mass in Worcester and in the state. And that's really been a wonderful experience. It's been so rewarding and interesting for me and the opportunities that I've found to serve and to learn are many. So I feel very fortunate to be a part of the Intergenerational Urban Institute and Worcester State College and I'm grateful for the many friends and contacts that I have made as a result of that connection. Thank you. There's so much more service that's happened on this campus, and we were trying to find a way to tap it all. Is there someone in the audience who has done a particular service project that you would share anything about that with us? I know that I know the nursing department has gone to Belize. I know people in communications have gone to Tanzania, and there are environmental projects that are going on. Uh, there's more happening than we know about. Uh, but today, even though only some programs are mentioned, the spirit of this is that we celebrate all of it, and we celebrate all of you. And I want to thank you for coming. I want to thank you for being part of this. And I have a big favor to ask you. Number one. Bye. 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 No. Okay. okay. I have a big favor to ask you. I've got a lot of prompts here. Um, one of the favors is don't forget to buy a cookie. Yes! Okay? Don't forget to buy a cookie. Uh, the walk is on May 18th, which is graduation day at Worcester State, which is a little tough for some of us, but you may know other people who can walk. Uh, don't forget to um, look at all the great uh, brochures that are here, and we've got to cut a cake. We knew it would be a good crowd. We knew you'd be hungry, so we got a lot of food. And in addition to the food on the table, I shouldn't say this too loud, we, we got some donations, and we have lots of bagels that are already bagged for you. So let them eat bread. <laughs> Please. And when you leave, we're going to, um, Carrie has the scissor. We want people to go with balloons. We will uncluster them. So please do that. And everybody at the table, you decide in your own way who gets the pansies. That's just, we're just going to leave that up to you. Okay. So please. <laughs> so please, party on.
Party on. Have some cake. We'll put some music on. And thank you, thank you, thank you for coming.